the Intellectual Gentlemen's Club. All right there, ladies and gentlemen from across the internets.com. Wherever you may find us and whenever you may find us, appreciate you joining us today. I always encourage all of our listeners to check out the website. That's intellectualgentlemensclub.com. You can find our links to Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, all that good stuff. We also have some uh, pages on there for a bio of everybody who's graced the show. A support tab if you'd like to use our affiliate links to Amazon, Onnit, or audible.com. There's also a PayPal button on there, and we also have a tab for recommended readings. Both guests today I have a lot of respect for, and both guests are return guests. First, we have Don Richard. He is a judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt out of the Detroit area. His gym is Fuse Martial Arts. That's at fuse-mma.com. He also teaches over at MASH Gym. You can find that at mashgym.com. And you may find him on Facebook at BJJ Moves. Usually he has a uh, move of the week that's up there. Appreciate Don for being back. Always a busy guy. Our other guest we have today, return guest, is Daniele Bellelli. Daniele is a previous guest. We talked about uh, his previous book, Create Your Own Religion. And we talk about his uh, one of his older books on the warrior's path during the podcast today. He's a university professor, a mixed martial artist, a podcaster, an author, and the middle finger of the gods. You can find him at daniellebelelli.com. Uh, Drunken Taoist, this is podcast. You can find that at drunkendaoist.com. And it's easily accessible on iTunes and Stitcher, just like we are. If you want to read any of his books, I encourage you to use either his Amazon link from The Drunken Taoist or my Amazon link for The Intellectual Gentleman's Club. It gives everybody a little extra cut. Today in the discussion, we talk about martial arts, a little bit of Taoism and Buddhism, some of uh, the challenges of keeping your mind clear, conquering some of your fears, and uh, we talk about hardship and tragedy and what the best way to come out of that is. We'll also talk a little bit about our munchkins and some of the issues we've all faced as fathers. If you don't think that's enough, then just tune in and you'll hear about the time Daniele met the Night Stalker Richard Ramirez. With that, there's nowhere else to go but the interview people. I hope you enjoy. The intro music is brought to you by Secrets. And as usual, we have a separate guest taking us out with our exit music. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back in action. IGC. Uh, welcome back to the Intellectual Gentlemen's Club. We're back again with two repeat offenders. We have Big Don Richard and, and Daniele Bellelli. Gentlemen, hey. welcome back. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. So uh, since our last talk, Daniele, um, you've had a lot of stuff that's been going on. It's been over a year now. Um, I think we talked just after you released Create Your Own Religion. Um, uh-huh. And we discussed that book a little bit in the last podcast. How's everything been with that? Or the has it has it been a pretty good uh, success rate? Any yeah, uh, any yeah, haters out there? No, I'm happy with it. It's um, I've been no overall feedback has mostly been good. People have been cool. So I think people who don't like that stuff simply just don't read it. So the majority of people who actually do decide to go through it are usually people who know what to expect and they dig it. Seems like a, expending a lot of energy if you're not really into it, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of have to have open mind, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, precisely. Cool. Well, um, I wanted to pick your brain about Taoism a little bit. I know that you've released a lecture series. I've listened to that a little bit. It's something that's been interesting for me for many years. Um, I dabbled in Buddhism for quite a while. I kind of labeled myself as a Buddhist for, for a long time, and now I'm more of a create-your-own-religion type of guy, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, and a lot of the ideas in Taoism resonates. It seems like it's uh, more of a philosophy than a religion. Um, same with, Buddha, with Buddhism, and, and that's what I like about it, is there's there's not as much dogma that's wrapped up into it, and a lot of it is uh, mysteries, you know, 
almost like uh, talking in Zen koans or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Both Buddhism and uh, and Taoism have this thing of uh, they start out as something that look a lot more like philosophies than religion in a in a Western sense. And then, you know, they mutate. And so eventually they will also take forms that are more recognizably religious. But the is not always clear who's following what. Somebody may be a Taoist more in a philosophical sense, somebody more in a religious sense. Sometimes the two there's overlap and sometimes there really isn't and sometimes they're really like almost different things so it's um it's kind of tricky but yeah it's uh, and also ultimately i personally don't even care about philosophy religion i mean to me there's stuff that helps elevate the quality of life and stuff that doesn't if it does i don't care what you call it and if it doesn't well i just don't care because it doesn't so i, I don't really need to worry about it yeah makes sense to me yeah. I heard one of my buddies on a different podcast he was talking about he came to this realization that he was a um he was a organism that was just trying to maximize pleasure and put as much avoidance to pain as possible. I think that's basically our our main reptile drive function behind the brain. Um but what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean that's kind of how everybody works, right? Unless you have some strange uh, S&M tendencies, most people <laughs> don't dig uh, being in pain and they dig pleasure. So yes, that would definitely be a primary thing for how most human beings work. Yeah, I guess pain can be that pleasure sensor in some people. Yeah, so be a martial artist, we gotta like it a little bit. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's true. We have to be into a certain amount of pain threshold. Yeah, right? that's true. Yep. Anyway, yeah. So both of you guys are longtime martial artists. I've dabbled here and there over the years, but uh, um, I'm back from an injury now, back to jiu-jitsu. It's been a couple classes now. I'm feeling much better about my place in the world, and I've got my stress reliever back um, for the most part. Over the years, you guys have done a lot of different uh, styles of martial arts, and both of you are, are quite accomplished looking at your bios. What would you say... If you had to narrow it down to one thing about martial arts, what would you say would be um, what drove you to stay with it over the years? Don, how about you? Well, kind of stayed with it over the years because it, it was always a positive thing in my life. You know, it was the one thing no matter what was going on when I went to martial arts, whether it had been whichever martial art it was, wrestling, judo, jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, whatever, it was always like a sanctuary. So that's what kept me interested and kept me involved. Now I have such a passion for teaching that that's what keeps me going. So that's for me. How about you, Daniele? Um, I think my natural tendency as a kid, I was always kind of a nerdy kid. So I always spent a lot of time inside my head and uh, thinking too much. And so I think martial arts is a great antidote to to that is something that allows me to just you know because even something like meditation works to a point because uh, you know when you are uh, uh, now i'm going to relax that doesn't usually work that way i need something that involves my body mind 110 percent to slow down my mind so i always found the martial arts like the perfect balancing thing for me to my more nerdy intellectual activities it was something that suddenly I discovered that I have a body, that I have all these energies inside of me, and that I can give my mind a vacation. And not only that, that's not just I get a vacation for a few minutes. I get something that then makes not only my body, but also makes my mind better. Because I'm going to function so much better after I spend two hours sweating like a savage and just training with everything I got. I find it, I don't know, for me, it's like essential to my mental health, which is probably why over the last few years I haven't been able to train much. And, my, <laughs> and you know, it shows. You both bring up uh, really good points there. Um, you're talking about a sanctuary, Don. And earlier in your book, Danielle, I, I was, I'm reading uh, On the Warrior's Path right now, and it was just talking about the dojo and it, that being a sanctuary, and you basically leave the world behind. It's one of those places where 
it's like a sacred space, um, no matter if it's a jiu-jitsu gym or kung fu place or wherever you're going to be. Um, when you step on the mats and you're in uniform especially, there's something that, you know, it clicks into your head. I'm here now. All the worries of the world seem to kind of disappear. That's what's been great for me. Um, and I, I, I've been a daily meditation practitioner for a long time, and I was always under the impression, like, I need to slow myself down. I need to calm myself down because I'm all worked up all the time. Right. But um, that's one side of it, right? That's, that would right. be like the yang um, or the yin, really, right? So mm-hmm. the, the yang would be the martial arts, right? Yeah. Something Absolutely. where you're using your body, um, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be martial arts, whether you're just pushing it to the limit, you know, getting that adrenaline pumping, getting your blood flowing, and uh, just making that connection, Daniel, like you're talking about. Mm-hmm. When you have the mind-body connection, it seems to be a, a lot more powerful than just with one or the other. It seems like it's it's lacking. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of the same for me, too, you know, like Daniel mentioned being able to meditate a bit, you know, and I'm not someone that can sit still and clear my head, you know, and when you're training martial arts or especially like for me with jujitsu or Muay Thai, you got to focus on what you're doing and you can't be thinking about outside of what's going on at that moment. So it kind of puts you right in the moment. You're not thinking about the past, the future, you know, you're kind of in the present. Yeah. When we were doing takedowns tonight, I wasn't thinking about, you know, how shitty my day was or, you know, right. at work, all these problems I've got, none of that. It just all vaporized, you know? Yeah, so like, damn, my phone bills do. <laughs> exactly. None of that's going on. <laughs> you know, you have to be right in the moment or you're going to get hurt or it, like I said, it, you're, you're kind of in that sacred space anyway. So yeah. And that takes you away from the, you know, like it's typical, you have a shitty day, you feel the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you, with the heroic effort of the wheel, you don't just die for the ice cream and disappear, but you just decide to go work out and train hard. And two hours later, you feel better, which is weird because you haven't done anything to solve the problems that you were dealing with. True. But somehow your mindset has switched. And, you know, partially the endorphins kicking in, partially the sweating, partially the whatever that may be. I'm not even interested in the scientific answer, but it works. You know, it does work in an amazing way, in ways that if you try to solve your problem when you are in the frame of mind you want, you know, you're just going to keep banging the head against the wall and you're going to feel awful. Right. Um, there's there's a different podcast I listen to is, um, and, well, you've graced it actually, Daniele, is uh, Warrior Poet with Arby Marcus. Uh-huh. And I love the the concept of warrior poet, and it kind of enables the body of the yin and the yang. Um, but <laughs> I just don't think that I could have one without the other anymore. It seems like once you kind of taste, you know, the variety of of life, it seems like you can appreciate both. You need kind of both, and you realize that you're off balance once once uh, once you don't have that. When I was injured over the last six months, it, it's uh, it was immobilizing. I was off my feet. I couldn't I couldn't even walk for uh, at least two months. I think it was, and I felt everything was kind of stripped away. Like all my stress relievers were gone. Like I couldn't drive, mm-hmm. right? couldn't take jujitsu, couldn't even fucking walk. You know, right. so I'm stuck alone with my thoughts. And this is a guy who's been meditating every day for the last 10 years. You know, I'm supposed to be like this, um, the sound mind, right? Yep. And almost immediately I fell into like a depression. Yep. And it was, and I, I knew what was going on. You know, I knew that I, I didn't have my release and all this shit was building up and I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and I, I talked about this with somebody else in a different podcast we did, but. It was something that I kind of had to come to terms with uh, before coming back. It was like I needed to accept that there isn't always going to be an external source for me to release my stress on. So when I'm 80 years old, what am I going to do? And I can't roll jujitsu, right? What am I going to do? I can't run. You know, I won't be able to move my body the way I am now before 40, right? Right. right. Yeah. So I'm thinking that's where Tai Chi comes in. <laughs> hey, there you go. Right? <laughs> Yoga. Yoga you can do forever, right? right? But what I mean is I think I had to accept the fact that I had to be alone with my thoughts. I had to deal with myself in in this way. I'm I'm not used to dealing with myself. And now jiu-jitsu is like a real gift for me. 
I come in like today, everything was evaporated. You know, by the end of the training session, I came out, I was feeling good. I even had some, some work shit that blew up during, uh, during training that I found out after on my phone. And it was like, wasn't a big deal where earlier in the day, it was like life or death situation, but it got me out of that mojo. Right. So. I was talking with, um, I was on a podcast, the Journey podcast with, uh, um, oh, yeah. Nick and Paul. Just, yeah, exactly. And they both guys went on here. All, yeah. Yeah. They're both big jujitsu practitioners. Mm-hmm. And, uh, one thing that, uh, I believe Paul brought up was, uh, we're talking about Marcelo Garcia and he said, you know, that guy always look happy. He always <laughs> look like, he, and then he said, well, he's spending so many hours a day doing something he loves and not just doing something he loves, but being in that state of flow being in that state where he's able to, it's like a movie meditation all day long that kick in endorphins and everything else. No wonder he's fucking happy. You know, it's, <laughs> like, yeah. it's and I was thinking about it. I'm like, that makes so much sense, you know? And, and then I started thinking about my own moods over the last few years. And I'm like, huh, look at that. You know, the time when I'm not training as much as I used to, suddenly I see that my moods are going up and down a lot more coincidence not at all it's exactly it goes hand in hand and uh, so I was like man I mean it's funny that if anybody I should know this I talk about this I preach this I'm all very big on this and even for me was uh, I didn't quite realize how how true that is how deep it goes so what's the what's the alternative for you guys Don I know you've been injured a number of times so what have you done over the years to kind of center yourself man with the injuries with injuries for me you know i was always teaching like so i've only been off the mats like in some form for only like maybe a few weeks at a time you know even like when i had my back surgery you know i was still on the mats teaching like i think at least three to three weeks to a month later and it was rough but you know i got through it and you know i had help you know helpers helping so um can't remember the guy's name now, but there was a famous red belt in Brazil that was an old school guy that got paralyzed later in life. And, uh, he, he would teach from a wheelchair, but they'd roll up to the mat and teach from the wheelchair, you know, have wow. people help him out, you know, and I kind of seen myself in that light, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at that time, you know, so I really haven't spent a lot of time off the mats. Um, so I've been fortunate in that way. Um, but you know, com- competitively I've, you know, been kept away for, extended periods of time you know kind of lost a lot of the window of my prime because of injuries as far as competing goes but it's actually like you know you're gonna find a way to train around your injuries if you know you're that determined you know what i mean mm-hmm. so like if my back was hurting i would focus on muay thai a little bit and you know on that regard you know because of that my striking game is almost at par with my jujitsu game now because i had right. you know had to kind of switch my focus a little bit due to the injuries so you know you find a way yeah. You know. mm-hmm. Let's talk. Let's talk about competition for a minute. You mentor a lot of local guys that fight MMA um, out of Fuse Martial Arts, your gym, right? And how has it been for you coming from over the years? You you started in. Well, I should preface this by Daniel. You talked to uh, Master Kaike, mm-hmm. and Don is one of his black belts here. Um, oh no way! Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah so. That was my first exposure to you. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, when you were when you were uh, coming up and training with Master Kaike, he basically mentored you, and he's still your mentor, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but it transitioned at a point to you starting to mentor people as well. Right. So what did that do for your game? What did that do well, for your mental health? The thing for me, though, is like when I first started training, and we're in Michigan, so... You can imagine what it was like in the late 90s here. You know, we're like 10 years behind everybody else. <laughs> you know what I mean? A little bit in some ways. So when I first started training, the highest ranked guy in Michigan, period, was a blue belt. Wow. So, uh, you know, I was basically being taught jujitsu by blue belts. And I had a wrestling background and a little bit of judo training. And the concepts and what and have you in the grappling game were familiar to me. So I, I excelled rapidly. So I was actually put into... You know, a little bit of a teaching role probably within two years of starting training. 
So that has always been an integral part of my understanding of the technique and how it's used and why it's used in certain situations. And it's still like, it's just ever evolving though. Like I think I have gotten better since I've been a black belt really, you know, because of teaching so much. Sure. Yeah. But as far as competing, I guess I just, I will always just do what I've been taught or what I had been teaching and go out there and prove it works. So I wouldn't try to make up stuff on the fly. I wouldn't, you know, I would just stick to the game plan, so to speak, especially in, like, jujitsu. How about the fear behind competition? Um, everybody has got fears. You know, even when I was going to the jujitsu competition, I had a lot of fears, rightfully so, I guess, right. as it turned out. <laughs> but, um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're battling that fear, I mean, it's – to me, it's most important if if you're scared of something and you know it's a feasible thing for you to do, you have to be able, you have to try and do it. Yeah, There's a certain amount too. of resistance involved, and um, I think fear is one of those guides. Like, right. you know, it, is it going to shear you away or is it going to draw you towards it? And a lot of times, fear scares me away, but a lot of times it does draw me towards it. And right. jujitsu is something I always wanted to try, and it's totally out of my comfort yeah. range still. As you know, right? You see me out there. Well, so. You're not bad. You gotta give yourself more credit. You gotta be more patient. But um, you know, if you're asking me, um, that's the one thing. I mean, I'm a big guy. I'm 250 pounds, and I've been that size. I graduated high school at 252 pounds, mm -hmm. so I've always been the bigger kid. That actually led to more fights than than avoiding them. You know, so I wouldn't say I ever conquered that fear, though. I've always been afraid. I kind of afraid to fight. More afraid to lose or afraid to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it was like, you know, my entry into fighting MMA was kind of conquering of that fear a little bit. And I, I wouldn't even say I've conquered it completely. You know, it's faded with experience. You know, I know what I'm capable of and I know I can hang, you know, pretty much anybody in the world, but you know, that fear of losing still comes in. Sure. Failure, you know, fear of failing. You know, or disappointing people or, you know what I mean, letting your students down. And in my case, you know, sometimes they're your friends and family. So there's some element of fear. There's also some element of, you know, that's part of the reason why a lot of us do that. Yeah. You know, a lot of fighters won't admit that, you know, but it's true. How about you, Danielle? Fear in uh, competition, I think it's uh, healthy. Do you think we need it? Do you think well, that you need it as a person to grow? Where it's you funny you bring it up because that's exactly... I finished writing a book a couple of months, maybe three months ago or something like that, and it's going to be out at the end of the year. And the whole book is about fear. That's the the one theme of the entire book. And it's divided in three parts, and one of the parts is about fear, my exposure to fear through martial arts. And the other two are more personal. They are kind of more life-related outside of the mat. But the first one is entirely about fear in martial arts, which so is exactly what we're talking about right now. And I mean, for me, it was, I don't know, man, it's like it was a whole level of fear that's like crazy, borderline paralyzing fear. Like it would really scare the shit out of me. And it always made me wonder, it's like, what exactly am I afraid of, you know? Um, and I realized a lot of it is an ego thing particularly, you know, nobody wants to lose or fail in any context, but in that kind of context, when we're talking about martial arts, when you're going to have another man physically dominate you, well, that's not a fun feeling. That's not something that anybody wants to go through. So it really was more of a fear. It wasn't so much, oh, I'm going to get punched or I'm going to get taken down. Who cares? It's more of that fear of... Uh, uh, it has a lot to do with self-esteem, with self-worth, with how you see... So it was an interesting journey because every single time I ever did anything, I would swear to myself, this was the last time ever. <laughs> I'm like, this fucking sucks. I'm never going through this again, you know. Like the million time where you wake up and you spend the entire like morning before a competition going to the bathroom six times in a row and you're like, Jesus, I'm just not cut out for this. This sucks. But um, at the same time, it's not even about martial arts because that's that just sort of highlighting something that you have inside of you all the time and you can hide from it in daily life. You can, because it's usually not going to come out in such an obvious way, but uh, facing it forces you to realize where you're at and forces you to realize, okay, not where you're at in relation to martial arts, but in relation to life. 
how much fear is still gripping you, how much is still as a hold on you and everything else. And uh, so the way is learning how to cope with it, learning how to react, some cases learning how to beat it, other cases then failing miserably. And, you know, the whole process, it's, um, it's an interesting one that I think ultimately we're all doing. Just some people will do it in a more conscious way. Other people will tend to run away from it more. But everybody's dealing with fear. That just, it's not an option not to deal with it. It's, um, or rather, it's an option not to deal with it in the sense that you can hide from it, but not that you are not, that is not a part of your life. And so figuring out how to do that is key because that will affect uh, your entire life. That will affect your ability to, you know, how many chances, how many risks you don't take because you're afraid. How many shitty relationships do you get stuck in because you're afraid of what the alternative may be. How many, you know, there are so many ways in which fear fuck us up and make us be the shadow of the person that we could actually be. So I think learning how to deal with fear is one of the most important things that any human being can do. I think I'm going to buy his book. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a couple of them. Yeah, <laughs> they all look good. <laughs> but that's part of um, what brings us to adversity, right? I mean, we need these challenges in our life to build us, build our character, right? right. I mean, yeah. how many people have you met that didn't go through any significant life event that were interesting to talk to I was gonna say if they didn't they were boring yeah they're pretty boring <laughs> you're you know? like oh well no everything's perfect you know? right hunky dory i don't want to watch the brady bunch you know Either people that, like the reality tv they want to see the fucked up shit well the people that say that are lying anyways so, right you know but then when we ask them hey how you doing do we really want to know the truth yeah <laughs> well honestly you know i got <laughs> well, this goiter kicking oh and... jesus <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean in the general um in general public, right? When you're out in in public, you know, somebody says, How you doing? You're gonna say, Oh, I'm fine. You know? I'm fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Right. right. That's what it really means. Everybody's running around, they don't know what the fuck they're doing. You know, we're all just trying to we're all squirrels trying to get a nut, right? right? <laughs> I tend to answer those questions with really what's going on and people were like you know that how you do it is just a rhetorical <laughs> question. You know, it's, I didn't really mean I wanted to actually know what was up. <laughs> oh man! Um, so I was listening to your, um, like I said, the the Taoist lecture series, and in there, you're talking about uh, what what I basically got the gist of it was the secret to happiness was basically just shit, piss, eat, and be human, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what I got out of that. Yeah, there's a, well, there's a whole tendency to mystify, to kind of romanticize what spirituality is all about, trying to turn it into, you know, these clouds of incense, guy meditating on a mountain top and becoming oh. one. Million <laughs> yeah, and it's really, to me, I find it refreshing when somebody has the guts to bring it back to a human level to bring it back to the whole idea that the sacred and the ordinary are not really that different. The only real spirituality is about going through life with full awareness, all of life. You know, my all-time idol, Zen master E.Q. Sojun, was a guy who, you know, his three main passions in life were Zen Buddhism, hookers, and the <laughs> sake. You know, and I love that. That's the Holy <laughs> Trinity, I believe, right? Yeah. And the, 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 but as long as he owns it and, yeah. you know, whatever, how can you be mad? <laughs> but, you know, when he was really old, his disciples gathered around him and he would, he would tell them, you know, after I'm dead, some of you guys are going to take to the mountains and meditate in the forest. Other, some of you guys are just going to spend in your time chasing women. And he would say, both types of Zen are fine by me. But if you become a professional cleric and start blabbing about Zen and the, as the way, then you're my enemy. You know, I love that he compare, you know, chasing women to have sex and meditating in the mountains, both as <laughs> equally good types of Zen. Both of them are... <laughs> and, uh, That's awesome. They both yeah. have quite value associated <laughs> yeah. with each, you know? Yep, yep, yep. Um, so... I'm a fan of uh, keeping it real. So is that kind of like a pursue your pleasure kind of thing? Whatever makes you happy? Is that like another way of saying that? Well, yeah. I think, it's about, I think it's about awareness. You know, it's about there's a way to be, 
you know, think about all the things that we can like. I'm sure you have run into a bunch of people who are jujitsu, martial arts, this and that. And even though they say they are, they have the same hobbies, so to speak, you really don't have much in common because the second you stop talking about jujitsu, you really have nothing left to say because their level of aware, the way they approach martial arts is completely different from the way you approach martial arts. Even right. though, you know, you're both dealing with martial arts, but is the awareness that goes with it, is the intensity, the passion, the the personality that you put into it. And so to me, that's what's interesting is more than this field or that field of experience is what's the energy that you put in there. And then at that point, it doesn't even matter what the field is. It's um, it's the magic element that goes into it that makes all the difference. Yeah, I agree. Was it Musashi who said, uh, know the way broadly and see it in all things? Yep, exactly. Okay. And his thing was about, you know, once you master one art, then you kind of know how to master anything else in life, according to Musashi, because his thing is, it teaches you, it's teaching you about life. It's not teaching you just about the technique. You know, even like martial arts, you learn how to put up the perfect arm bar. Well, that's great, but how many times are you going to need it outside of the mat? You, if that's all you learn, technique, yeah, that's nice, but you really haven't learned much that serves you the other 20 hours of the day when you're not training. Some... But uh, uh, learn the other stuff, then you learn about life. You, you can apply it to anything else. Yeah, it's amazing how many people that that concept kind of seems to escape them. I mentor to a lot of young, young, young guys, like Jason said, and had a couple 20, young 20 something year old boy, you know, firecrackers, right? Yeah. Well, they just don't get that part of what we're trying to do. You know, it's not just about the jujitsu. It's about how you are as a person and, yep. you know, <clears throat> being accountable and responsible. And these are kids too that like don't pay a membership, but are being like mentored. And right. that, that, that whole concept just escapes them. They don't get it. You know, no matter how many times you explain to them, Hey, look, you know, you're helping with the kids class. It's important for you to be at the tournament when they compete. Right. When, when you shouldn't even, I shouldn't have to tell them that. Yeah. You know, and it's like, man, why don't you guys get it? Don, you've, you've, uh, you've taught kids off, obviously throughout the years as well. And you've seen some of those kids grow up. Do you notice a big difference between kids that started martial arts when they were younger as they come up versus people that maybe start in their 20s? Do you, do you see a big attitude difference? Where is that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think just people that train martial arts or that that have trained martial arts for an extended period of time, that those people tend to be a little more well-adjusted. You know, they deal with conflict and obstacles a lot better than people that don't have that discipline, I guess, and the confidence, too, that comes along with training martial arts. I like to see, like, a weak, frailer type of kid grow and see the confidence grow and them, you know, I've seen several of them grow into, you know, upstanding young men, and one of them made it to the UFC, right. matter of fact. So, and that kid was, you would never think twice of him when he was 12, 13 years old. He just was a little... <laughs> little punk kid <laughs> but you know what i mean you know but through growing up through martial arts it kept him focused kept him in a, well, on a path and you know several other guys too but um you know that's kind of what it was for me too it kind of kept me centered kept me on a path that you know i had to be accountable for you know if i wanted to achieve my goals and everything you know just it made me more well adjusted deal with people like i have like very few, if any, enemies for myself. You know what I mean? Because right. of how I deal with conflicts. It's always like more understanding, I guess. Try to see their point of view because I don't have such an ego and I have to have my way. I always have to be right. You don't just rear naked choke people on a whim? No. Because you don't like them or you have <laughs> <No>. a disagreement? <laughs> Man, that's, that's Sometimes you I like you were a black belt. Like, like, like for a split second, you, you might want to. <laughs> 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 but I'm sure Master Kaiki is one of the. Choke me a few times too. I kind of keep that in mind. Like, don't choke him. Just. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like when you saw Miles get to the UFC? Oh man, it was. You know, we talked about that since you know Miles was like 14, 15 year old kid, and I basically told him, "Kid, stay on a path." And I'm telling you right now, you'll fight in the UFC. And he believed me. You know, and he believed in himself, and that was just amazing to see. You know, that actually come to fruition. 
you know, 10 years later. Right. You know, and then he stayed on a path and we were on that path together, you know, so it was really cool. You know, I got to be there. And, you know, it was awesome, man. You know, I was really happy for him and it was a good moment for me as a coach, you know, because mm-hmm. I've always believed in myself and he's proof, you know, as a coach that, you know, I can, I can train some of the best in the world. Right. You know, so that was great. How about you, Danielle? Have you, have you had any experience with uh, training kids? Um, no, I've never have. I, um, I'm trying to think of, no, not really. I just started, you know, recently, the last uh, month or two, I started bringing my daughter to train uh, judo at a place where I'm going to train as well. And so she comes along and we play a little together. Then she goes on her side and she does her thing. And I'm kind of like still trying to figure out the whole pedagogy with kids because obviously it's very different from training adults. And um, I'm kind of blown away by the skills that it requires because it's a whole different set of skills compared to being a good teacher for adults. So I'm sort of in an observation phase, just trying to see how the games play out. It's kind of scary thinking about Isabella throwing some judo moves down <laughs> on somebody, buddy. Oh, man. <laughs> Today, uh, to give you an idea of the vibe of the little lady. And by the way, she's super sweet, and she's just, you know, sensitive and affectionate and all that. <laughs> and yet, today, like at one point, she, she started out all tender. It started out how I'm, uh, oh, you know, yeah, I want to spend all my time with you. I want you to be home with me all the time. And I'm like, maybe I do as much as I can. You know, sometime I have to go to work. And she's like, but why? Why do you have to work? I'm like, well, you know, need to make money for our house, our food, your toys, everything, right? And she thought about it for a second, and she goes like, you know, just kill your boss, steal his money, and just stay home with me. <laughs> How old is she? She's five. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> That's so. cute, though. Oh, man. So I was like, yeah, it's, I it's, see the point. It's cute so. as in you don't want to you want to sleep with one eye open, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, again, I can't complain. The other day we watched together Conan the Barbarian, so I can see where that's <laughs> coming go. from. You know. Well, I have a three-year-old that uh, we just watched Star Wars for the first time. The original. Nice, yeah. nice, <laughs> so nice. That, was, that nice. was good. Speaking about raising kids, I mean, all of us are fathers. Um, I mean, it's changed my life in ways I could never even imagine, and I'm sure it's the same for you guys. Yeah, for sure. Um, Danielle, you've been a single dad now for a while. Um, what kind of changes have you gone through with, uh, after the loss of your wife, dealing with um, having a kid on your own? I mean, it had to have been major, major life transformation. Yeah, I mean, it definitely kicked my ass on one level because, you know, just the practicality of it was brutal, which is why, you know, I haven't really been able to train much over the past, uh, when I think about, yeah, basically, when she was, since she was born, the last four to five years, I've trained a fraction of what I used to train before which also in itself kind of messes with your brain. And um, and then everything else that happened. And so, yeah, I've been, has been tough. You know, every, of course, as they grow up, it gets easier and easier. Every six months is way easier than it was six months before. Right, yeah. So there's that aspect that certainly makes things um, more more manageable as time goes by. Wait till they get about Until, 13. Yeah. yeah. About 13 <laughs> changes a little bit. It's rough, man. <laughs> My Isabel yeah. is at 13. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I don't know. I'm less bothered. Again, I may probably change my mind by the time I get there, but I feel like I, I have a really hard time, you know, when you're dealing with a one-year-old who can't express what's going on, yeah, where I can sit too. down and have a yeah. conversation. Mm-hmm. That's where I feel like, damn, that's testing me in a way that, uh, you know, ever since she has been able to, we are able to have more real conversations, I find everything so much easier because then I actually know what's going on. And even if, you know, we may disagree or we may have the issues, at least it's clear to me what actually is going on. With a baby, you can get mad at a baby for being a baby, you know? <laughs> at the same time, it's frustrating as hell sometimes. Stop when, crying! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's wrong? Exactly. So it's, um, yeah, well, I find it way easier now, that's for sure. But um has been rough in a lot of ways. At the same time, has been awesome because she's, I have, you know, especially now, I'm just, I have so much fun with her. She's just, uh, I always kind of write down some of the things she says because they are so just weird, hilarious, <laughs> just out of, it's just too cool. Sometimes I'm, like, I look at her and I'm like, 
who the hell are you? You're some really strange creature that I have here. <laughs> because so no, there's it come in some way it helped me a lot. I mean, if uh, if I didn't have her when my wife died, I'm sure things would have been very different in a lot of ways. In some way, it would have been easier from a practical standpoint. In other ways, it would have been a lot harder emotionally right away. Because, you know, at the moment, I did not have the luxury to kind of sit around and uh, whine about, oh, life sucks, uh, look at me. <laughs> it's like I have a kid who's 19 months old who need me to be happy, who need me to not just change her diapers and feed her, but also need me to be happy. And so that kind of forced me to stop feeling sorry for myself and just snap out of it and see what I can do for her. And, you know, in some way that helped a bunch, I'm sure. Yeah, sometimes we have to live for other people to get us through our, our uh, challenging times. I know Absolutely. Uh, when when my father died, um, my daughter was uh, six months old. And, uh -huh. you know, it was devastating to me at the time. And uh, the effects have been rippled, you know, <laughs> from the last uh, 13 years on that. But I... You know, you had to, I had to get my shit together. It's not like I didn't have time to just sit around. I do, I'm responsible for my wife, I'm responsible for my daughter at that point. Mm -hmm. My son hadn't been born yet. But yeah, I mean, you have to just kind of have to pull your bootstraps up, I guess, as they say, right? Was and, that your first experience with like a real close tragedy like that? Uh, it was, yeah. yeah. Um, I had lost my grandfather when I was, I don't know, probably six. Maybe. Yeah. And that was kind of traumatic at the time. I, I was real close with him and I've always dealt with death pretty harshly. Right. And, but with my, when my dad died, you know, it was a suicide too. So oh, that okay. was even, that's terrible. Even more so. It was, right. it was, uh, it was a very strange situation and to have, I had like been at three funerals that week when it happened right. and it just it was all right. kinds of fucked up. Um, I was unfortunate that I dealt with tragedy close like that when I was a kid. My little sister had gotten hit by a car by a drunk driver oh my God. walking, Ish. and I was right next to her. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that was rough when, you know, I was like 10 years old. So that was my first experience with like a tragedy like that. Yeah. And that's you know, so I could say, you know, in a way, like, I wish I had been an adult and I could have dealt with it better. You know what I mean? So that was another reason. And she died in that accident? She died shortly. Like, Within, like, she was Down syndrome. So, and, you know, I don't know if it probably, of course, put a factor, but when she got hit by the car, you know, she kind of went back to baby stage, you know, like oh, tracheotomy, yeah. food, you know, tube in her belly. And, you know, she eventually died of, like, uh, <sighs> like, uh, the, uh, complications. It? Well, yeah, complications, but, uh, she got pneumonia in the hospital. Oh, man. Yeah. So that's how she passed away. So it was like two years later. You were but, 10 years old? Yeah, when she got hit by the car. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. How so. do you guys deal with the fact that, uh, as, uh, all these stories, uh, that we all seem to have point out to the fact that life is horrendously tough and not as an exception, you know, that's sort of the rule. And then you may get lucky and actually not run into it all that often. But for the most part, a lot of uh, loss takes place in life. And uh, how do you guys deal with that uh, aside for the specific event once it happens, like afterwards, just the very existential nature of the whole thing of the fact that so much of, you know, everything you love at one point or another got to be taken away from you. Um, it makes it scary to hold on, you know, like sometimes yeah. you're like, you don't hold on too tight. You're afraid to lose something, you know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. And it might hold you back. You know, I think, I don't know for sure if that's been an issue in my life, but definitely, you know, it's definitely crossed my mind for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I know for me, um, the existential, the existential nature fucks with me on a daily basis and not just death, but just why are we here? What are we doing here? What's my purpose? That whole song and dance, but death takes on a different toll or a, a different, um, I don't know, a different persona for me. It's, uh, I go through these phases. Like I lost my grandmother over the summer and she was the matriarch of our family and, you know, the kindest woman that I've ever known. And, you know, it was a tragedy. And, but I realized, you know, she's 88 years old. Right. She lived a damn good life. Yeah. Right. She really didn't suffer that much at the end. And she went out with her wits, you know, and, and she went out and with her whole family by her side, quite literally. Right. 
Um, it doesn't get much better than that, right? Right. Um, so so should we why should I be so her? sad? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you know it's very sad. You know that the the loss of somebody that you know you're not going to be able to talk to that person or gain any more wisdom from that person um, face to face. You know, I'll gain wisdom from her down the road. And I'll remember her, and you know, she's was a part of my life. So that's how I have to think right. about that. But I think it's a a real fucking shame um, across the board that people do have to die. Right, right, right. And when you think right. about it, like these great masters that we've had, you know, whether you're talking about scientists or, you know, people that have built great things or great leaders, people who have conquered fears and done amazing things, everybody has to die. Nobody's getting out of life alive, you know, and all this information, like when Stephen Hawking dies, right, he's got all this information stuck in his head and there would be thoughts to be had in the future would be groundbreaking ideas or albert einstein or whatever but we're going to lose him someday and Mm -hmm. thank god we've had him for this long with als it's amazing that he's still around right um but i think there's so much knowledge and life experience with every individual on the planet that it is a tragedy every every time somebody dies um i i like to believe that in this pie in the sky idea about after death, you know, that we're all um, put back in the melding pot, right? And we we gain that sense of knowledge that that one individual has had because we're all part of oneness. You know, is that how it is? I don't know. That's that's my... It's a great question. What is? Yeah, what is? You know, nobody yeah. knows. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that... I, I question it all the time, you know, to, to answer the question is... The existential nature of, of death it's it's um it's what gives us the zest for life at the same time so i mean it, i understand the older i get my clock is running shorter you know with, with the older i get my body's breaking down i can't do what i once was and i'm now i'm getting to that phase and i understand what midlife crisis is kind of all about right, right? i'm right. rapidly approaching a meltdown not yet i, uh, I just turned 40 so yeah i got yeah. a couple couple years right. that, that's it um but i think it's super important that you have you know death to appreciate life you have the dark to appreciate the light you know right. you have these these um, opposite forces that you really need to complement each other, just like the yin and the yang. Well, the one thing that kind of gives me comfort is the fact that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Mm-hmm. So you know, we're energy. You know, something's going to happen. We just don't know what it is. Right. You know, I kind of, you know, whenever my time comes, I guess we'll have all the answers. You know what I mean? Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> In the meantime, you know, I'm, you know, keep my, keep my, uh, Keep mind my open. Keep nose clean. Yeah, well, keep, keep my mind, mind open. open. <laughs> you know, don't discount anything just because it doesn't line up with what you've been taught growing up or whatever, you mm-hmm. know. I think if as long as it's good, it's good. I think we run into a lot of problems like labeling good and bad. Um, like my kids, a number of times would be like, well, he's a bad kid. I'm like, well, why is he a bad kid? You know, and they're like something like, well, you know, I heard that he smokes pot or something. <laughs> right. You know, it's like... Well, let's break this down. Why is this bad? What what does bad really mean? What what is good versus bad? It's all perspective. Right. Ted Bundy. Okay, maybe we can we can agree that uh, yeah, he's probably it's bad. bad. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he's probably bad. everything's a spectrum though. That, you know, it falls somewhere in between, and everybody's views that they they have on the world affect their own subjective view of the world. You know, we don't right. look at it through objective eyes. You know, sometimes you can have certain experiences or you know the flow state or different times in your life where you can see things a little clearer you have like this little eye shot into clarity you know that's why meditation brings me back every morning right because i always get these little tiny insights that, that keep me hanging on so i don't know on the ted bandy thing i had once um uh, many years ago i had uh, kind of a long story i'm gonna skip all the context but Long story short, I was in the visiting room of uh, death row at San Quentin State Prison. And uh, hmm. I saw, you know, everybody in the visiting room, as there are the visitors and then the people you are visiting, they are all people who are there because, it's, I mean, I'm sure there's the one guy who's innocent, but for the most part, it's going to be people who have killed somebody or have been responsible for some pretty heavy stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 
most of them, they look like the guys you meet on the streets. There's their vibe is not that, you know, they don't, nothing screams evil. Most of them are guys who can probably be nice guys in the right environment, but, you know, if they want something and you are in the way, you, well, you're dead. But that doesn't scream evil. Then there was this one guy where I look at him for like five seconds and I was like, Jesus Christ, who's, who's that guy? <laughs> and you know, if you stand out in the middle of death row, that's saying something it about you. Something. <laughs> and, Some um, heavy energy. Yeah, and one guy told me, oh yeah, that's uh, Richard Ramirez. Oh, and, you know, I don't know if you are yeah. familiar, but Richard Ramirez was like one the of night the most... Stalker, right? Yep, exactly. And uh, and I remember the dude was just staring at me, and I, I had this vibe of, okay, now I know what evil looks like. You know, this is not like the other dude who shot somebody robbing a bank, who was just drunk and high, and, you know, his priorities were fucked up. Or but desperate. Or... Yeah, it's not the same thing. This is a dude that gets off on people's pain. That's a whole different kind of game yeah, going on here. That sadistic type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's where I was like, okay, maybe there is something objective about it, you know. Uh-huh. Maybe once you pass it a certain point, there are certain levels where is there's nothing subjective there anymore. I mean, you have the nature and nurture argument, right? Mm-hmm. But you can, I mean, either one of those can be taken to an extreme. Yep. You know, you can be born into this world with horrible genetics mm-hmm. and you're destined for your body to fail on you pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Or you can be born with a perfect genetic structure and be brought up in a fucked up environment and be told you're worthless every day and deal up with, you know, grow up with that. I th- I believe that psychopathy you can see on an MRI of the brain. Oh. It's an actual physical thing that they can see. There's parts of the brain that uh, the aren't working. Right. Yeah. It's the empathy receptors or there's something like that. We were yeah, talking I about think it I earlier. saw something like that. I can't remember how exactly it went down, but yeah, I think you're onto something there. One of the earlier podcasts we were talking about um nine eleven we had on Michael Fullerton and he really has done a lot of uh research into psychopathy and uh sociopathy. And it's incredible that they say um one percent of the population is out there like that. And these are people, you know, just like you're talking about, Danielle, they're, you know, they're in a prison cell, but they look like a normal dude. Who, who, who do you know? Just like when you go to a bar or something like that, you don't know who's a trained MMA fighter. Right. right? You don't know who's, I mean, you can generally, if you're looking at somebody face to face, you can feel their energy as a human to human. You know, mm-hmm. there's yep. an interaction that happens before a conversation is even stricken. Right. You know, if, if you can tell if I'm going to be, if I'm extremely upset you're not going to come at me like you would if hey everything's all hunky dory <laughs> right so there's a lot of that uh the uh body language right you know, that you yep. have to pay attention to yeah and absolutely. sometimes i think that just taking a look at somebody you can get a lot like i think we psych ourselves out like we think like oh no i'm not being fair i'm i don't really know this person i should give them a chance how can i form a judgment based on a fucking dog wouldn't psych themselves out that way they just sniff you for 10 seconds and quickly decide whether they want to bite you or or rub (laughs) up against you you know it's like they feel something and they are not gonna say oh but i don't know this person no i can sense it it's right there you know i wonder what that says about me i was almost killed by a german shepherd when i was six (laughs) (laughs) literally though like uh you never seen a scar on my shoulder but uh that was um, from when you were a kid? That was from when I was six years old. God damn. So imagine well, if that would have been a little higher to my jugular. It ripped a chunk out of me. I actually yeah. got bit by a Doberman when I was ab- about the same age. I snuck into my neighbor's backyard, and he got me right up in my upper thigh. Oh, that's dangerous, too. Yeah. I'm real I, went to the, I went to the hospital. It was like a big ordeal. It was something that stuck with me, but I'm still a dog lover. So right. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah, total animal lover. <laughs> yeah, to the point where I almost contemplated becoming a vegetarian for a minute. Uh-huh. Yeah. Been but, there, yeah. yeah. Man. That, that beef's so good. Uh, <laughs> in that situation, it's uh, it doesn't say necessarily something about you. Maybe they're just were asshole dogs. That's well, all. Yeah, I was a little kid, and it, you know, it probably made the dog nervous because I was scared. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was just joking, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I love animals. Or I delicious. like animals more than people. You're saying? No, I like animals <laughs> more than people generally. Right. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. 
Yeah, I mean, an animal, you know, like a dog, since we lost my dog back in October, anytime I'm around a dog, it's like, they get my full attention. Right. You know, I don't care what kind of dog it is. As long as they're cool with me, they're getting showered with love. You ever you notice, know? like, your dog never has a bad day? Yeah, it really He's always in a good mood. Yeah. Like, he's in the same mood every day. He's always happy to see you. You know, unless it did something wrong, I think it's just getting in trouble for. You know? So what's their secret, Don? I don't know. Probably consciousness. <laughs> 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 or self-conscious. I don't know how would you yeah. explain that. Like I the, think we're in our heads our, too fucking Our consciousness much. level. Uh-huh. You know? Maybe we're just in our heads too much, and the animals just, you know, they shit, piss, eat, and just be themselves. Right. right. They want to be petted and loved, and I guess we all do too. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. They got, I think they got to figure it out, though. I tell you what, they, they uh, grabbed onto humans at the right time in history because uh, they've been immortalized in a place next to us. Right. Everybody loves a dog, unless they're allergic. I'm allergic, and I still love it. Hmm? Still love them. There you have it, people. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a dog my whole life. I didn't realize I was allergic until recently, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can't be too bad, then. Uh, yeah. No, it was pretty bad. Actually. <laughs> it got worse after my nose break and everything. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know why, but it did. What, what is it about animals that, uh, do they have some, some type of innate sense and they're more in touch with their inner nature than we are? Well, I mean, there's something to be said about the instinct. Uh, mm-hmm. There's something to be said about kind of more intellectual side that we develop in a way that animals do not. But there's also something to be said about instinct. Um, I don't think we do ourselves a service when we become too brain reliant and kind of give up on our animal instinct. I think there's very powerful about those instincts. There's, uh, I mean, think about it. The example we were using earlier, the body of another person is giving you a mountain of information about who that person is. And most people just are completely oblivious to what's going on. They would just not, uh, they're not really going to pay attention to it, or if they do pick up on something, they don't trust it. And I think that's really silly. I think that's kind of a rationalist perversion of just missing out on an extremely important source of information because you think that's somehow below you. Oh, that just, you know, instincts are real, man. There's something there. And uh, and then there's a way to test it. You know, there's uh, somebody knows somebody else and you talk to that person about what you see in that person, and then they can tell you whether that fits or doesn't, and then you learn whether your instincts can or cannot be trusted. Um, in my mind, uh, to me, is I can't even tell you how many times, like I'll, first day of classes when I teach, uh, when a semester begins and I go around shaking hands with people, before I'm done giving away all the syllabi, by the time I get back, I haven't yet said one word and I already know whether that semester is going to go well or not, just based on the vibe I got from a lot mm-hmm. of people, you know? It's yeah. like uh, I've had uh, podcasts where maybe I'll meet somebody in the parking lot and be like, hey, what's up? And we go up and I take them up to the studio. And as we're climbing the stairs, you know, 99% of the time I've had good experiences. And there were a couple of times that the second we touch hands, I was like, yeah, today's going to suck. That just, oh, wow, wow. Two days done, you know. I might as well go home now because there's no point. So I think that maybe the the Western world has, <coughs> excuse me, they have a tendency to rationalize everything. And when you're, rationalized, when you're rationalizing things, you're probably going to double think your gut instincts. Like I know my wife, mm-hmm. she's got impeccable first impression. Mm-hmm. She, she will tell me dead nuts on 99% accuracy if this person's legit if they're full of shit or you know whatever right yep Yep. i'm not that guy i i don't know maybe maybe i suppress that instinct um just because like we're talking about earlier we want to give people the benefit of the doubt right right um so maybe if i because my brain is thinking that way then it just overrides the program of (laughs) you know the instinct of run away from this person yep and more often, you know, you get in trouble because of that type of thing. But I don't know if that's something that we are. I mean, you're the uh, you're the educator, Danielle. So maybe you can speak for for us here. Do you think that that's happening with the younger generations? Do you think that they are just 
creating more or less soldiers instead of warriors where you're just doing what you're told instead of thinking for yourself? I mean, I think, to be honest, I don't think there's a generational thing. I think it's an exception that throughout history, throughout any ethnic group, any religion, any nation, any historical period, the majority of people are what they are, but luckily there are exceptions who are who have considerable more that X factor that the average human being doesn't have. The other, that doesn't mean that the average human being is an asshole. It just means that they lack that extra something that makes them... So, I don't know. I'm personally interested in exceptions. The average of anything... The, I don't like the average martial artist. I don't like the average Italian. I don't like the average American. I don't like the average. I don't like the average anything. I know? like that. Yeah. It's uh, but I do like exceptions in every single one of those fields. You know, there's not a single nation on earth in which I'm not gonna find somebody who's an amazing human being. Uh, there's not a single religion on earth where I'm not gonna find one person who's amazing. You know, it's. Um, but that's what I'm interested in. Is kind of that human quality that. Unfortunately, it's not very democratic. It doesn't get distributed equally among everybody. Some people, whether by, as you are saying, kind of that nature-nurture debate, who knows whether it's somebody's soul or if it's how they were brought up or if it's a combination of the two. But the end result is some people have it more than others. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. You know, over the years, we've all met countless people, right? Yeah. In yeah, I mean, it definitely rings true. Yeah, I agree, too. So what do you have coming up in the future here, Daniele? Well, one of the things that, I, that I've that i noticed is that um, I've been... I think one of the things that happened is that over the last few years, one of the ways for me to feel alive has been to jump into a million different activities and be constantly burning the candle from 15 different sides. And... Now I realize that that, I mean, sure, it may have been, it may have been helpful for a while, but it's really not that healthy. It's not a good idea for me to be involved in 17 things at once every single day. And so I'm trying to slow down, to be honest. I'm trying to do less than before. Now, do less is still a relative concept because I'll still probably do the work of three people, but at least it's not the work of seven people. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, because it's one, these are all things I enjoy. So not doing them, I feel bad not doing certain things, but there are also 24 hours in a day. And so I realize I need to slow down more. I need to enjoy what I have rather than constantly being chasing the next thing. So, you know, now I just finish writing a book. And I have another probably 10 books I want to write tomorrow. But I told myself, no, just shut up for a while. Just slow down a little, focus on other things. Don't write a line for the next year. You know, just done. Not now. So what I think I want to focus on are, I mean, I have to just money-wise, I need to teach college the way I've been doing because that's the way I make my money. The, um, so I have to do that. I... have um, I enjoy continuing with the Drunken Taoist podcast. I'm planning on starting a second podcast, kind of along the line of hardcore history, doing mm -hmm. a more looking forward to that. Yeah, I yeah. love history. So, and I've been, I've been saying it for a while, and I keep working at it, and I'm getting closer and closer to being able to do it. But it's you know there are 17 things distracting me, so there's always it's a much slower process than I would have liked to. But I think it's coming, you know, I think in within the next few months it's going to happen. And then last thing I was working on with a friend, we were working on uh, writing a screenplay because we had a sort of big shot producer who asked us to do that. So let's see whether that goes anywhere or not. doesn't even matter right now because I'm done with my part. So if I have to get busy, it's because they sold it, in which case that's awesome and I need to write more. But otherwise, I don't need to write just as a, for the hell of it. So that's it. I kind of want to leave it as is. Nothing, nothing beyond this. And, uh, and I think it's good because this is four different things and four I can still handle when it's seven, eight, nine, ten. No, too much. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I mean, the book that I was telling you is going to come out at the end of the year, but I don't have to do anything for it anymore. It's done. You know, I wrote it already. So that's a done deal. That's nice. I, I think I need to follow suit on that. I feel like I've been in a pressure cooker lately. 
Don, how about you? What do you got coming up? Oh, well, you know, I just opened my new school in a new location and uh, just building that up right now and it's growing. You know, I've probably grown 30% since I've left my previous location. And that's and not too long ago. It's only been, what, a no, month? Oh, yeah. It's only been like a month and a half, two months, almost two wow. months now. That's incredible. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. So just a short move, too. We only moved an eighth of a mile. You know, we're just in, our, just in our own building now. So, you know, it's been huge. I was in a, a gym. Yep like a weightlifting gym and I was running the aerobic room mm -hmm. and, you know, now that we're in our own building, this is going great. So been uh, just focusing on that, getting everything all buttoned up because we kind of opened kind of quickly. So kind of preparing for like a official grand opening and getting the sign up and all that kind of stuff, you yeah. know, and you know, that, and you know, got some irons in the fire and, you know, some other things. So like jujitsu related and teaching related. So that's all in like the budding process, but I'm looking at like a second location potentially down the line here. So, Sweet. yeah, so I've been busy with that and, uh, you know, I got a strong MMA team, uh, again, you know, finally it took a while to build it back up, but, uh, you know, my guys are, you know, all tearing it up right now. Yeah, so they killed it at the Joe. Yeah. Five and one that night. We just won a belt last, uh, last weekend. Um, one of my little young guns up and comer. You know, he's going to be one of the ones. Josh, right? Josh yeah. is. He's probably going to make it to the show eventually. He's 19 years old. And just a physical specimen yeah. and a sponge. Cut, good looking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, ridiculously good. He's got everything not yeah. going for him. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I feel ugly in pictures next to him. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah I mean, got some good kids in camp. You know, they're all, you know, it's like a family. You know, even at Mass Gym, too. I mean, it's all, you know, we're working all together. So yeah. I'm at two different gyms teaching now and. Everything's gelling really well where the whole team's growing stronger. So just put all my focus on that pretty much. And, you know, that's, that's what's going on with me. Awesome. Uh, Danielle, let me ask you, what's your process when you write? Do you like do a lot of research and then write notes and then write from there? Yeah. Or are you writing from your head? No, I have to, some people do that where they kind of go where, whatever they feel and they sort of make it up as they go. I don't. I really need to have structure. So okay. I have, uh, files of, uh, I mean, just about anything I've written, I had usually files in which I add the notes as they come to mind over a period of months or even years for a really long time before I ever got to write. Wow. And then one day I'll sit down and look at like, okay, I think I have enough material and I'll start seeing patterns and divide it up in different chapters and so on. And that's when, um, that's when suddenly, you know, by the time I want to write, I want to just focus on style. I don't want to focus on content, on uh, you know, what follows what. You know, I want to already have the structure in place. I want to already have all the content. It's just become a game of uh, and now I want to make it sound good and just focus on the style. Yeah. So, um, again, everybody works different about stuff like that. But right. that's, that's how it is for me. Yeah, it's fine. You know, I'm not much of a writer myself, but I'm a philosophy you know like I, I talk about in class you know things that are on my mind so like i was always curious how the process went with writers you know because writing is like my least favorite thing i love reading hate writing <laughs> right but i think that probably helps you like retain the knowledge that you're researching and things like that you know yeah like definitely. me i'm kind of a history buff but i don't really remember exact dates and locations and time frames and things like that necessarily you know something well, yes, unless yeah. you have to I mean, of yeah. course, I learned, uh, I understood and learned more history ever since I had to teach it. You know, like with martial arts, when you have to teach, you get so much better at the material than you were before. Right. Because the way is like, yeah, martial arts is no different. You know, it's like when you have to explain it to somebody else, your comprehension of what you mm -hmm. are dealing with becomes instantly deeper than right. before. Yeah, it makes sense. And it's the same thing, with, I think, with anything else. I guess kind of teaching is teaching. You know, yep. and it kind of forces you to break down the information and understand it better. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly how it is. Yeah, that's cool. What, what's interesting about his books is when you read one of his books, you're only going to hear his sultry Italian voice reading to you. <laughs> that's the problem yeah, with right? reading his books now. You know, like I'm picking up this book. I'm like, God damn it. I keep hearing this fucking Italian accent. <laughs> Oh, the funny. Thing, oh, oh, sorry. The in all of this is that I don't think I have an accent, but like I don't hear it <laughs> when I speak. You know, right. when I hear a recording of myself, I'll be like, oh, Jesus, I do speak like a fob. Jesus Christ. How many languages do you speak? No, I just speak Italian and the English. Okay. I mean, I understand Spanish just because it's so, so similar, it's right? so similar to yeah. Italian. 
But yeah. um, I've always but been fascinated with people that can learn multiple languages. It's like, hard, man. Yeah. It's, well, you have to be immersed in the environment, right? Yeah, completely. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no. Yeah, otherwise there's no way. And, right. and even if you do learn it, unless you stay, unless you keep using it, it, it goes away. Why is it that we always wear, learn the swear words first? Those are the fun ones. <laughs> <laughs> like Spanish swear words. When I learned Portuguese a little bit from jujitsu, it's always a swear word. <laughs> then as you grow up, you try to say, you know, swear less and less. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I, I, I try. That, I yeah, try. I don't, I don't think I reach that stage. Me yet. either. Yeah. Yeah. I try because, because I teach little kids. And things like that. You know, I don't want to slip. I'm like, you shits. <laughs> Yeah, that'll raise a couple of eyebrows, I'm sure. Yeah, right. I don't know. Sometimes uh, I think they want me to punish them more. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, guys. Well, I've, I've kept you both over an hour here. I just want to say thank you again for, for both of you for joining. You've both been um, a mentor for me, Don on the mats and off. Daniele, I listen to your podcast all the time. I've heard John Rogan a number of times. I follow you on other ones as well. Um, thanks for all your wisdom over the last couple of years I've been tuning in. Uh, and I appreciate uh, what you both brought to the conversation here today. I, was, I really enjoyed myself. Yeah, thanks for having me again, man. It was awesome. And, Daniele, I'll be looking at some of your stuff, man. I, I'm interested in a lot of things you talk about and the books that you're subject to, the books you're you're written. So I'm going to so check much. you out a little bit more, you know. So I was actually listening to a few things and reading a few things today. So I'm going to check you thanks, out a little bit more. Man. Thanks so much. I hope you dig them. Yeah, I will, man, for sure. All right, guys. Well, enjoy the rest of the evening uh, or our morning, Don, Right <laughs> as, as it is. So um, appreciate it again, guys. So uh, until next time, hang loose out there, everyone. And so goes another edition of the IGC podcast. Thanks for joining us on episode 45. We've been doing this a couple years and enjoying every minute of it. Be sure to check out our website at intellectualgentlemensclub.com can find all our links on there all the previous podcasts information about our previous guests and how to support the show i encourage you to check out both of our guests projects you can find more about don richard at fuse martial arts at fuse-mma.com or at mashgym.com and daniele you can find daniellebelelli.com or the drunken Daoist.com. today our exit music is brought to you by kennedy the track is called karate I thought it might be fitting. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. This is Jason Abbott, and I'll see you next time. Hang loose, guys.
I never said I was a gentleman, motherfuckers. Actually.